Franz Kafka, a frail Jew writing in German in Christian Czech-speaking Prague, was triply alienated by a failure to achieve an intimate adult relationship, by being the deprecated other, and by associating himself with a foreign culture. Yet in many ways, this precisely mirrors the widespread modern condition we have come to call Kafkaesque, struggling vainly against every sort of indifference to find a connection with a person, belief, or social institution that will support us. In parables such as A Common Confusion, An Old Manuscript, and Before the Law, Kafka makes these failures poignantly clear. Nonetheless, in masterpieces like The Metamorphosis and The Judgment, we see that his knowledge of existential failure led to artistic success. Still, reading The Truth About Sancho Panza and A Hunger Artist, we can understand why Kafka, fortunately unsuccessfully, ordered his unpublished manuscripts destroyed. Franz Kafka, as I say, led a triply alienated life. He was a frail German-speaking Jew born in Christian Prague. Although German was often the language of Prague's intellectuals, they were all aware of being different from the Czech-speaking majority. For the Christian intellectuals, this difference often felt like a mark of superiority. But for the non-Christian intellectuals, this difference often felt like a mark of Cain, privileged though shunned. Judaism originally mattered little to Kafka, except as a mark for others to use against him. In his later twenties, he was moved by Yiddish theater, became close friends with one of the actors, and began his serious study of Judaism. In other words, he came to his heritage through art. But that heritage, like his art, gave Kafka neither social justice nor personal happiness. The term Kafkaesque has entered modern languages to indicate the implacable futility felt so commonly today, the inhumanity of institutions in our industrialized world. The global currency of the term acknowledges that Kafka's writing epitomizes this alienated condition. Kafka's shortest works, typically called parables, represent his felt life transformed through the fantastic. A Common Confusion is one of the greatest but most enigmatic short stories of the 20th century. It begins, A Common Experience Resulting in a Common Confusion. Its structural truths, I think, emerge from subtle ambiguities of language, which we can see from the title itself and the very first sentence. In English, the word a really has two meanings. A can mean something drawn from a sample. I have a book here in my hands. Or it can mean one. I have a wife who is without peer. Common has itself a couple of meanings. It can mean something we see all over the place, as common as dirt or it can mean something which is déclassé. He had a very common manner about him. Confusion has two meanings as well. The prime meaning is some sort of befuddlement, but etymologically it means to melt, fusion, together, confusion. When things melt together, you can't distinguish one from the other. So A, common confusion, actually is composed of words which are each ambiguous. That is, technically speaking, we can't decide which of the meanings they have. In fact, in the original German, the title is Eine Alltägliche Verwirrung. Eine has exactly the same two meanings in German that A has in English. Alltägliche, which is translated as common, actually has three meanings in German. It means every day. It means common in the sense of every place, and it also means trite. And verwirrung means befuddlement, but just as it comes to mean that, just as confusion comes to mean that in English by meaning to melt together, verwirrung means thoroughly mixed together. 
So in German, the title actually has 12 possible meanings. 2 times 3 times 2. The title itself is a common confusion, something shared between us. The story begins, a common experience resulting in a common confusion. The word experience is in German, Vorfall. That's not the only German word for experience, but that's the one that Kafka uses. And it does mean an occurrence. It means that which befell us. But it also can mean that which fell in front of us, that is, an impediment, something that kept us from moving forward. And, in rare instances, Vorfall has another meaning in German. It is what we call in English an escapement. An escapement is a pivoted set of teeth that engage the teeth on a gear to prevent the gear from simply rotating. When you wind the spring of a clock, if you released the spring, the clock would simply unwind and we could not tell time. The forfall rocks back and forth to engage the teeth and release them, engage them and release them, marking off the time, in the case of this story, the time of our lives. Kafka uses ambiguous language, technically ambiguous language, in order to let us see that the most common things stand for the most mythically, idealistically important things. This story says, in its second sentence, A has to transact important business with B in H. And he goes to H. He makes it there in 10 minutes. Because he has to finish the business the next day, he travels again. This time he says, feeling that all the surrounding circumstances, surrounding, going around one, circumstances, standing around one, again, multiplying the possible meanings, all the circum surrounding circumstances seemed to be the same, and yet it took 10 hours to get to H. In fact, when he arrives there, his, the housekeeper tells him that he must have passed B on the road on the way because B got tired of waiting for him. Then A decides to return home to see B, and he says, without thinking of it at all, without paying any particular attention to the fact, he returns home, quote, practically in an instant. What Kafka doesn't say explicitly, but what I think is quite clear here, is that when we think of time, when we think how hard it will be to get where we want to go, the time lengthens. And in this fantastic tale, the world's time lengthens around him. He leaves in the morning and doesn't get to H until evening. But when you don't think of it at all, time flashes in an instant for all practical purposes, practically in an instant. Time, in other words, which seems to be one of the great externalities, in fact, is one of the great internalities. When A gets home, he finds that B has been waiting for him upstairs in his own room. He goes up the stairs hoping to reach B and finish his business, but we are told that he twists a sinew, he stumbles, and almost fainting with pain, incapable even of uttering a cry, only able to moan faintly in the darkness, he hears B, impossible to tell whether at a great distance or quite near him, stamping down the stairs in a violent rage and vanishing for good. And that's the end of the parable. A fails in his errand. And yet, that last phrase, for good, has two meanings. For good can mean that he leaves forever and will no longer be in our lives. But there is in Christianity the so-called doctrine of the fortunate fall. Why did God create us? so that we would be tempted in the garden, and we could be disobedient, and we could incur original sin. And the answer to that is, in the doctrine of the fortunate fall, by becoming sinners, we now have the power, though we don't all seize it, 
to overcome our sins and to rise to be saints, even higher than the angels. In other words, God let us fall for our good. B comes down and goes past A for good. Is this story of a common confusion about perhaps the confusion that we misunderstand the spiritual world with? Kafka sees a world in which spirit is often very, very badly served. An old manuscript is another of his parables. This is a story in which the emperor withdraws when barbarians come down into the city. The barbarians even eat their own, they sleep with their own horses in the street. In order to keep the barbarians from depredating them, one of the shopkeepers brings out a, an ox, leaving it to the barbarians to slaughter. In fact, they eat it live, burying their teeth into the ox alongside their carnivorous horses. The ox bellows pitifully, and the shopkeepers hide under their counters. If you take a look at a Roman Catholic church, or certainly cathedral, in Europe, you will see often a design that shows the 12 months of the year, and figured among them you will see four symbols. An angel, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. These four familiars stand in order for the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The ox is the symbol of the Gospel according to St. Luke, and it is in fact in Christian iconography the symbol of great patience. The ox suffers because the tradesmen don't know how to deal with the emperor. But the narrator says he thought he saw the emperor for a moment at a window, but he withdrew from it to go look at the interior courtyard. God has kept the garden for himself. We are on our own. We live in a Kafkaesque world. There is no old manuscript in the story called the old manuscript. The story is the old manuscript. It's the human condition. We believe someone will protect us. It's up to us. We are inadequate to the task. It's a grim, grim world. In Before the Law, a man presents himself to get justice, but the gatekeeper will not allow him to enter unless certain things happen first. The man accomplishes each of these things, but when he finally reappears, He's told it's too late now to go before the law, and this door will never be opened again because it was meant only for you. The law is constructed to keep us from getting justice. Consistently in Kafka, what we have is the use of references to social institutions, be they law, be they language, be they religion, to show us that we think that we should be satisfied, supported, and made happy by them, but in fact, we are not. In many of his masterpieces, Kafka, like Hoffman, tries to use the fact of creating written art to imply the possibility of there being some salvation, although, in fact, Kafka's art is about the inevitability of loss. In his perhaps most famous work, the Metamorphosis, Kafka begins with Gregor Samsa awakening with this line. As Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a gigantic insect. This is a fairy tale set in a gritty modern world. Why does he become an insect? He becomes an insect because, if we read between the lines, he wants to withdraw from human responsibility. We come to understand that he has been what's called a commercial traveler, that is, a salesman, scurrying here and there in order to create an income that can support his family. He wants to support his sister's music lessons. 
He wants to contribute to the rent. He's been told that the family needs the money. Freud talks about infantile fantasies. Infantile meaning that they arise at the time when one is an infant. Infant meaning without speech. Freud's notion is that each of us comes to learn as an infant that when we bellow, the world will respond to us. We cry out and someone cleans our bottom. If that's not we, what we want, we cry more and they feed us. Eventually we get what we would like and we stop bellowing. This experience, which is our earliest interaction with the world, Freud suggests, leads to two psychological fantasies. One of these is called the illusion of central position. As for all I can tell, the world entirely is around me. The other is called the omnipotence of thought. If I want it, so it shall be. Although these both grow out of infantile experience, they are in fact separate. Children, reading fairy tales, often see the omnipotence of thought carried out. Because the protagonist wants to succeed, the protagonist succeeds. For adults, we haven't quite given up these fantasies, but we view them pervertedly. If I were to say to you, tomorrow is supposed to be beautiful, and I haven't had a chance to chat with you in ages, let's have a picnic, and you were to agree, that would be lovely. If the next day I called you and said, I'm sorry, I woke up this morning, and guess what? It's raining. You might say, wouldn't you know it? But if I called you and said, guess what? It is a beautiful day, as predicted. You wouldn't say, wouldn't you know it? You'd say, oh, good, thank goodness. In other words, as adults, we still believe that the world responds to us, except we believe it does the opposite of what we want. We don't have omnipotent thoughts, but we still may feel the illusion of central position. Of course, we may not. We may believe that the weather is bad or good for some other reason entirely. Why? The weather is beautiful because it's Easter Sunday, and God always makes it beautiful on Easter Sunday. These illusions, in fact, are taken up by all fairy tales and modified in adult fairy tales. So, Gregor wanting, unconsciously, I'm sure, like Gretel who wanted to displace her mother in Hansel and Gretel, Gregor not wanting to be a commercial traveler anymore, thinking of himself as some kind of mere insect in the absolutely unending and trivial world of retail economy, wishes that he could get out of it. And he does. You notice, he doesn't wake up horrified. He just wakes up. The transformation is unwarranted, but it supports this fantasy. He needs to escape his condition as a traveling salesman. Even his name suggests this need. Gregor comes from Gregory, it's just like the English Gregory, and it may mean watchman, that is, watchman, the person who watches the flock. Gregor comes from the Latin Grex meaning flock, and it leads to words like egregious, something that's outside of the flock. Gregor is a watchman. He should be taking care of the family. Samsa, though, that's a strange word. Now, you need to know that beginning with the Grimm brothers, the Germans had a strong interest in pursuing research in antique religions and cultures, and this included studying Indian um, religion. Nirvana is that famous crossing over out of the unending cycle of birth and death and rebirth to a place of peace and quiet. Every English speaker knows the word Nirvana. The alternative to Nirvana, that cycle of birth, death, and rebirth is Samsara. Gregor Samsa is caught in this cycle 
and wants to get out, although he does not admit it to himself. His psychology brings about this metamorphosis, and his metamorphosis brings about metamorphoses for every other member of his family. His sister, who had just been practicing her violin, goes out and becomes a milliner's clerk. His mother begins to become a seamstress, making other people's undergarments. And the father, in a demonstration of how the Samsa family relates to the economy, gets a job as a bank guard, in uniform, guarding other people's money, but bringing home some money for himself. In other words, these people have all been changed in response to Gregor's change, and only then do we discover that the father actually had the money all along. He didn't need to have Gregor support the family. There is a crucial moment when Gregor, as an insect who's fed only by his sister, who brings food into his room, begins to come out of the room because he hears music. The father gets angry and goes and tries to push him back and heaves an apple at him, which catches in his back like original sin and festers there. If you read the details carefully, you discover that his transformation occurred on Christmas Day. And he finally dies on what we realize is Easter. As Gregor dies, his sister rises. The viewpoint of the story changes, and Gregor's sister Greta, G and G, Gregor has gone down, Greta has gone up, Gregor, Greta is taken out to the park for a picnic with her parents. And the last line says that in the spring, she stood up in the burgeoning springtime and stretched her young legs. Gregor becomes a self-sacrificing character to bring happiness to the world, not by empowering someone, but simply by getting out of the way and they then can become better on their own. Good for them. No good for Gregor. To make money, in fact, the family has brought in three boarders. And these three boarders, maybe they are wise men, demand the use of the kitchen. They see Gregor and they decide they can't stay anymore. And they storm out. When Gregor finally dies, a charwoman, we are told, had been is the only one who will deal with the body. Later, when the family comes back from services, they ask about the body, and she says, oh, don't worry, I've taken care of that. There's no explanation of how she took care of it. However, just before the family comes back, we're told that the butcher boy goes up the stairs as the three boarders go down the stairs. He passes them, and on his head, he's carrying a tray full of fresh sausages to deliver, clearly, to people who live in the apartment building. Obviously, what the charwoman has done is given this body to the, to the butcher's uh, delivery boy to take the body back so that the body of Gregor, like the body of Christ, will be made into sausage. That's what the modern economic world does and fed to the masses. Now, this perverse kind of Christ imagery is not meant to suggest that Christianity is good or bad. It's meant to suggest that we are pitifully on our own and the institutions that would support us, in fact, consume us. This runs through much of Kafka's work. In The Judgment, another one of his great works, we have a character who claims to be having correspondence with a friend of his in St. Petersburg, this character, as far as we can see, mostly takes care of his frail old father, so frail that he has to pick him up in his own arms and put him into bed and carry him away to the chamber pot and so on. But strangely, the father begins to criticize and then insult the son. You have a friend in St. Petersburg? I have a friend in St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg, the city of St. Peter, Peter the rock on whom I will build my church, Rome, Vatican. What old man has a friend in St. Petersburg? This old man in the judgment becomes a godlike figure. He stands up and he virtually 
touches his head against the ceiling of the room, and he condemns his son to death. The son goes out of the house, he walks across a bridge, and he jumps over into the stream of traffic. Again, what we see is that the old gods do not support us. The belief that we can find some connection to them through institutions fails us. And the failure is not one of the old parabolic out in the desert with the burning bush kinds of failures, but a failure brought about by being engaged implacably in modern industrial technological society. A traveling salesman, a stream of traffic. These are images of why we are all fundamentally alienated, why we live in a Kafkaesque world. Is there no way out of this? Well, in another one of his shorter parables, called The Truth About Sancho Panza, Kafka gives us an interesting possibility. Sancho Panza, you'll remember, is the fat, in fact, Sancho Panza in Spanish dialect means wide belly. Sancho Panza is the fat, happy, lower class character who tags along with Don Quixote. As Don Quixote, a great fantasist himself, he sees giants where we know they're only windmills, sets out to right the wrongs. And although the wrongs he sees are often imagined in their details, the world of Don Quixote indeed has many wrongs that need writing. Sancho Panza follows him through Don Quixote, one of the great novels of Western culture. The truth about Sancho Panza begins thus. Without making any boast of it, Sancho Panza succeeded in the course of years by feeding him a great number of romances of chivalry and adventure in the evening and the night hours, in so diverting from himself his demon, whom he later called Don Quixote, that this demon set out, etc., etc. And Sancho Panza follows his own demon, that is to say, his own spirit, which he has created by diverting his own spirit with romance, with excitement, with imagination. Then, a free man, no longer having his demon within him, Sancho Panza philosophically followed Don Quixote on his crusades, perhaps out of a sense of responsibility, and had of them a great and edifying entertainment to the end of his days. That has a much happier sound than most of Kafka's writing. But we need to think more deeply. The only reason Sancho Panza finds the contemplation of Don Quixote great and edifying is because Sancho Panza demands nothing back from the world but to be able to watch someone else having an adventure. Sancho Panza is disengaged. Art can only save us if we don't care to be in the world. Once upon a time, there was actually, in reality, something called a hunger artist. These were people who made livings by being in sideshows, for example, by being on public display and simply not eating. Sometimes they were allowed to drink, sometimes they weren't, but people would watch to see how long they could survive without eating. Kafka has a story called A Hunger Artist, and in Kafka's story, the man at first thinks, I'm a great artist. Then, as he persists in not eating and not dying, but becoming thinner and thinner and thinner, the public interest in him wanes. Eventually, the exhibitor removes him and puts in his place a panther who stalks angrily back and forth. That the public enjoys. But the hunger artist withers away and dies without anyone even noticing that he's gone. Kafka died of tuberculosis, which he suffered from for most of his relatively short life. Most of his stories he never tried to publish. He submitted The Hunger Artist for publication in 1923. Then he died, and then it was published in 1924. Kafka's tuberculosis had made him, like Gregor Samsa, too difficult to feed. And probably then, like The Hunger Artist, he died of starvation. It is no wonder that Kafka asked that his unpublished manuscripts be burned at his death. 
because art did not offer consolation and did not for him represent triumph. And yet, the power of these parables is so great that it is no wonder that his friend and executor, Max Brat, fortunately defied him. Was this Kafka's ultimate ambiguous failure, the publication of these manuscripts he did not want published? Or was it the triumph of his imagination?